Hi folks, Harry Frank from Red Giant here, and in this lesson we're going to continue our previous discussion on the crowd replication and talk about shading options, lighting, and cameras. Now in the previous lesson we set up our crowd, so basically we got the crowd replicated in 3D space, but for it to look real we're going to need some more realistic rendering here. Things like depth of field, motion blur, and lighting are going to go a long way to sell the realism of our crowd scene. So let's jump back to where we left off, which is right about here. I've turned up my exposure just a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. Let's go to form here and look at the rendering options down here. By default, form does not render depth of field unless you tell it specifically to render depth of field. Now this is going to share the settings with a camera that you've got in your scene. So make sure you've got a camera. Now if you select the camera and hit AA, we'll see our camera options in here. We've got depth of field. So if I turn that on, we're not going to see anything just yet because we need to tell the rendering mode what to do. Now we've got two options. One is a square option, which is basically a square or box blur. And one is a more smooth rendering blur. I like that one a lot better. It looks a lot more realistic. Now when we have it set that way, we'll find that the focus distance and aperture will all control the focus of trap code form. So in other words, form will follow the options of the camera. Another thing that it will follow is the motion blur that should be created as the camera moves. So if I set some keyframes here with position and point of interest, we can see that motion blur will render with the particles. Now to set this up, I'm actually going to use another option in here in my render mode, which is motion preview. What this is going to do is set basically a single point for where each particle should be. This will make it a lot easier for me to move my camera around rather than rendering all those custom particles. Maybe I'll set a little bit of rotation here or orientation. So we'll set it rotated one way and then have it rotate the other way. So if I park it right here in the halfway point, we should have a fair amount of motion blur. So let's go back to our full render with depth of field and go into motion blur. Now motion blur by default uses your composition settings. Now we can just turn it off so that it never renders motion blur, or we can have it on and have custom settings in here. But let's talk about the comp settings first to make sure you know where those are. If you hit Command or Control K, you'll bring up your composition settings. And in the Advanced tab right here, we have Motion Blur, which has the shutter angle and shutter phase, as well as the number of samples per frame. So shutter angle is basically how pronounced the motion blur is, how much blur is going to be captured in one frame. So higher the number, the more exaggerated the blur is. Now the samples per frame really boils down to how many particles are going to be rendered for each single particle to create that motion blur effect. So if that sounds like it might take a long time to render, you're right. If I set this to 16, this is going to render 16 particles for every particle that is calculated by form. And that is how the motion blur is going to be calculated. So even though 16 samples per frame might look really good, it is really going to add to your render time. So that's the comp setting. So basically this is going to share the motion blur with any of your 3D objects in the scene. I could just turn this on and manually define it here. So if I really want an exaggerated motion blur, I could do it like that and not have the motion blur exaggerated with other objects in my scene. And again, the levels right here, that is the number of samples per frame. So the higher that is, the longer it's going to take to render. If you can, I would suggest to keep this to a relatively low number while you work and then reserve the higher number for your very, very final render. Now, the other thing I mentioned that will help sell the realism of the scene is lighting. And we control that with the shading section of trap code form. By default, it is off. And when I turn it on, my scene is going to go dark. 
The reason it does this is because it's waiting for us to control the lighting of the scene. So I'm going to create a light and we'll start with a point light. Now what you'll see is that the particles around the area of the light are going to be illuminated. Now by default, lights have a natural fall off in that the intensity of the light decreases with distance away from the light. And that is a natural behavior of lights. If you want to turn it to no fall off, you can simply set the light fall off to none and it will illuminate particles equally. I don't really like how that looks. In fact, it is sort of an old way of how After Effects used to light objects and that's a bit outdated now. So really, you're going to want to leave this on a natural lighting fall off. The area in which the particles are illuminated 100% by this light is the nominal distance. This distance here, measured in pixels, is an area around this point light in which particles will be illuminated 100% by this light. Now it's important to understand that because I see a lot of people reach for this as the first way of increasing the lighting of the scene. And although it'll do that, what it's going to start to do is really make more hot or overexposed particles. And I don't think this is an ideal look. What I would recommend to inject more light back into your scene is to use the next option, which is the ambient control. Now to use this, we need an ambient light in our scene. So I'll go back to new light and add an ambient light. I'm going to leave the intensity of this at 100% because the effect of that ambient light on the particles is controlled by that ambient control. So if I turn up the ambient, we'll see more of the particles that were off in the darkness start to illuminate. So we might want to find some middle ground here, maybe set this to about 35. And that feels a lot more natural rather than cranking up the nominal distance to make some really hot overexposed particles near where the light is. Similar to the ambient control is the diffuse control. This is how much the particles reflect light. Or another way of looking at it is how much the surface of the particles absorb light. So a lower diffusion is going to mean darker particles. And that's going to be across all aspects of the light reflection. So a higher diffusion will mean that more light is being reflected by the particles. Now these next few items here, specular, reflection maps, and shadow lits, aren't best shown through this example, but I'll quickly talk about what they do, and then we'll get into better examples that show these in later lessons. The specular mount is essentially a metallic or glossy reflection that happens in the particles. It's kind of a direct re reflection of the light as it comes from the light, hits the particles, and reflects back into the camera. So how much of that specular amount is defined by, well, the specular amount? That certainly isn't rocket science. In this kind of scene, what you can see is that the distant particles are reflecting light back into the camera. If we'd like to decrease the area in which particles are reflecting, or essentially the width of the area or the uh, angle of the area in which particles are reflecting light back into the camera, we can turn up the sharpness and we'll have fewer particles or a more narrow area of particles around the light reflecting that specular back into the camera. Let's turn this up to something like 300. Now below that we have this reflection map and although that can work really well with 3D particles and their angle to the camera, in a situation like this reflection maps can also be very useful to introduce an ambient lighting into a scene that you're trying to match. So let's say I, I drop this reflection map in here, go to form, define that layer as a reflection map, and turn up the reflection strength, we'll start to inject the reflections as well as the ambient light of that image. And that is a good alternate to using ambient lights if you're trying to match a specific lighting setup from perhaps footage or a still that you've shot. But like I said, we'll see other examples that show these a little bit better once we get into using 3D particle orientation and rotation. Below that we have shadowlets, and I'll show you a better example in a little bit. It's basically a projected shadow behind each particle. And this could be really useful for sorting out depth 
with particles that are very close together. In this scene, I don't think shadowlets are going to do a whole lot of good for us. So really, your lighting is going to vary greatly from the type of scene that you're doing. If you're doing motion graphics or you're doing visual effects, you'll find different functions to be more useful than others, depending on the particular project that you're working on. Now, I'd like to back up and talk about a few things that I kind of skipped over because the crowd wasn't exactly the best way to demonstrate some of these parameters. So we're still talking about shading section and how shading interacts with the particles as well as the shadowlets. Now that crowd wasn't a very good demonstration of the shadowlets. So in this case where I've got some box strings and the particles are white and although there should be a sense of 3D here and as I rotate around you can kind of see that we've got these strings and they're kind of twisted around each other. But visually it's hard to see where things kind of sort out in terms of depth. And shadowlets can be a great way to have this uh, visually provide that separation. So I'm going to go into my shading and turn shading on. Now, even though we can turn shadowlets on independently of the shading, you might want to have a light in your scene because shadowlets can interact with your light. So Let's go down to my shading section, close everything else up here. I'll turn shading on so that my lights uh, now affect my particles. And, and what you can see is a huge difference between what we had before and what we had after. So let's turn off shading and let's turn off shadow lits. There. So if we turn shadow lits on, now we can kind of see that separation between the layers and how things sort behind and in front. Now. We also have control over that shadow lit projection. Now, by default, it's uh, set to auto, which is basically going to uh, provide a, a best projection in terms of its location behind the particle in relation to the camera. But we, we have other options here that interact with the light. Now, if you want that light to interact with your shadow lits, we need to go in and change the name of this light to shadow. The light that is matched with that name of shadow, which by the way we can change in the options here, we can change the shadow light name. But once we change the name of the light to shadow, this light is now going to control the angle of the shadow lights. So when we change this from the default setting of auto which basically determines kind of the best setting for projecting the part of, uh, the shadow light behind the, the light. When we set it to project, this is going to position the shadow light at a depth that depends on where the shadow lit light is. So not necessarily best location, but completely controlled by the light. And we also have two other options that either put the shadow light entirely behind the particle or always uh, in front, which I don't know why you would want to do that. Generally, you're going to leave this to auto unless you really want to get detailed control and use the, the shadow lit light. Now, we don't have to just have that shadow lit light. We can mix and match our lights here. So we can have one light that simply handles illumination. So perhaps we set this to a different color. So this is going to color the particles, and this light over here is going to control the shadow lit angle and location. We'll get into a little more detail using 3D particles once we cover layer maps, because layer maps interact with the 3D nature of the OBJs that Trap Code Form can use. So we'll talk about that in one of the upcoming lessons where we cover both quick maps and layer maps.